Thank you very much, Samantha. Let's meet our guest this week. Catherine Hakim is a social scientist and the author of a book called The New Rules, Internet Dating, Playfairs and Erotic Power. Milo Yiannopoulos is a columnist for the website Brebert. The Reverend George Hargreaves is a Pentecostal minister who's based in Scotland. And Rabbi Jonathan Romain is the chair of Interfaith Leaders for the campaign group Dignity in Dying. Thank you very much, all of you, for joining us on the programme this morning. Life is short, have an affair. That's the tagline of the online matchmaking agency Ashley Madison, a website for married people who want illicit relationships. Its members, it's thought, and there are more than a million of them in Britain, are now threatened with exposure to hackers. Well, there's been no shortage of coverage over the past few days on the ease with which the digital age makes adultery possible. But can, can such sites actually save marriages, as some have claimed this week? We're asking, is infidelity ever justified? Let's talk to Catherine first, because you've been looking at social trends and attitudes for many decades. How surprised are you with those numbers, that it is thought that 1.2 million people in this country are seeking illicit affairs on this website? Well, the numbers are surprising for Britain and equivalently for uh, North America, only because Puritan Anglo-Saxon attitudes in these countries decries affairs. 80% of people say that they're completely wrong. Only one in five says that they're acceptable. But the numbers wouldn't be surprising if you're talking about continental Europe, where affairs are much more accepted as something that happens throughout a marriage if you're lucky and if you know how to go about them, uh, hence the, the, the rules, if you like. Um, so I think there's a possibility that some of these internet dating sites aimed at married people are actually exaggerating their numbers, that's, that's a thing. Uh, but if you look at the sex surveys that are carried out in Britain, 10% uh, of men, married men who've been married for at least five years, say that they've had an affair at some point and 5% of women have say that they've had an affair at some point in time. Whereas in France, it's uh, estimated that a quarter of all married people are having an affair. Well, it's about whether you time. admit to it or not, of course, as well. That, that's another thing. But you've said that sex is no more a moral issue than eating a good meal. The fact that we eat most meals at home with spouses and partners does not preclude eating out in restaurants to sample different cuisines and ambiances with friends or colleagues. Do you really think it's that commonplace, that accepted, that unthinking? I think the key thing that we've got to recognize is that first the contraceptive revolution of the 1960s has changed sexuality. In the past it used to be entirely about reproductive sex. If you had sex it was almost inevitable that you, you ran the, a serious risk of having children and that created moral issues. Whereas nowadays with contra proper contraception, a reliable contraception, most sexuality is recreational. And if it's recreational, there are no, if you like, consequences. No and consequences it, even in a marriage. If, and if therefore it's possible for people to have premarital sex, and that's now become acceptable, mm -hmm. and extramarital sex is the logical consequence as well. Reverend George. No consequences. Recreational. This is crazy. <laughs> of course there are consequences, because actually marriage and sex are intertwined and actually the sex act is a part of the covenant making of a marriage. And so when you break that covenant by taking your sexual activity outside the marriage, of course there are consequences. You know, I read somewhere, I think it was the Ten Commandments, you know, that shalt not commit adultery. These were not ten suggestions, these were commandments because actually it's not that God wants to stop you having fun, it's the best thing for society, for this marriage bond to be secure and the trust to be maintained, and part of that is the sexual act stays within the marriage. Do you think uh, we're talking about these, these websites that have sprung up to allow people greater accessibility to have these sorts of affairs? Rabbi Jonathan, do you think it, it, it's sort of the, the digital age has somehow made it a lot more, a lot easier? 
Not really. Uh, I think people have always had affairs, and it's always been uh, people have uh, done that. And, and it highlights two issues. Uh, firstly, that actually, to be honest, we are biologically geared to be attracted to other people. And, and, and monogamy is, although it's good and it's moral, it's actually unnatural. And if we have to fight quite hard to be faithful, the rewards are worth it, um, and, 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 and it is a good marriage is great. That's quite um, an interesting thing for a rabbi to say. Well, it's being honest. It's being honest. <laughs> and we are, we are by, but by, by making is not something that is natural to people. It isn't, but, but the benefits are great. I mean, physically it's not natural. Uh, morally, emotionally, it's very good to actually uh, have a partnership with one person. Um, but it also highlights that if you are having an affair, maybe there's something wrong with your marriage, and that maybe, rather than seek diversion elsewhere, you should try and fix it. And maybe to sort of... Uh, rephrase that Ashley Madison um, uh, saying you, you started off with, uh, Sean. we should say life is short, make sure your marriage is working properly. OK. Milo, what are your, what are your thoughts on this? I mean, you heard what Catherine was saying about it. perhaps um, British people have a slightly puritanical approach um, to, to sex within and marriage it's, it's and a good job marriage. that they do. Um, you know, I mean, no serious person is going to complain about women's emancipation and women's equality, but the fact is women have been getting unhappier every decade since the war. You know, women report themselves as being more miserable every decade than they have been doing for the last 50 years. And part, I, I think, it's because that covenant that you're talking about in religious terms, I think there's a, there's a, there's a um, you know, there's an emotional component to relationships, the, um, the act of sexual congress that is so tied up with the emotion and commitment, that sort of stuff that makes us feel grounded, feel centred, feel happy, particularly in a world that's so disorientating and confusing, uh, you know, it's, it's a very important thing to have that bedrock. And when we lose that, we get miserable. Um, you know, people are unhappier as a result of the fact that, you know, having more uh, sex outside of, of stable relationships, they're unhappier because, you know, the, the, in some ways they're unhappier because of this sort of sexual liberation. Well, do you think that um, the seeking it online makes it different in terms of a moral comparison with, with a, a adultery happening because, as, as Rabbi Jonathan says, it's quite hard to be monogamous and, he believes, it's not natural. I don't think the, inter the internet introduces any moral difference. What the internet does is it, it introduces uh, economies of scale, new efficiencies and new methods to do the same things. I don't think it changes the underlying morals. The problem here is that men and women are very bad at communicating with one another about what they want and very bad at being honest with one another about who they are. Um, men, you know, I think 25, even, even your, your continental statistics, 25% of men cheating, that doesn't seem nearly enough to me. Um, you know, I think all men cheat at some point. And all men cheat at some course. point? Of course, yeah, of course they do. What, what I think evidence men... do you have for that? No, well, I'm saying, you know... What I've... do you call cheating, though? Well, I think men uh, step outside of, of um, committed relationships without telling the, their partner. I think I think pretty much every man I know has done that. Maybe it's the and circles it's I'm. Men, is it? Maybe because it's the circles are, I'm moving. There are women who I think, apparently belong to I think women website. probably cheat less. Women maybe. probably cheat less. I think yeah. the statistics well, are. You so want back the that statistics. Up too. Men are twice as likely to have affairs right. than yeah. women. Um, but in know, all countries, it seems. There's a reason why I asked you what do you mean by cheating, because Jesus is teaching on adultery when he's saying, you know. We shouldn't have adultery. He said you shouldn't even look at a woman lustfully. <laughs> and now, every man's done that. I'd say we can put our hands up to that. But it's actually coming to the point to say, okay, I fancy that woman. It's hard because I would say there is a propensity for mankind to sin. That's why we need a saviour. That's why, no, why we need Jesus because we have a propensity to sin. Therefore, monogamy is hard. But you know, I think I think Rabbi. Don't they call it a fence around the Torah? Where you, yeah. Where you, you, you stop at the thing that would lead to the, to the sin, which is the thought, of, oh, I love the look of this woman, and wouldn't it be nice? You stop there, because Jesus said that's what you've got to catch, not even the adultery. Well, and there's a big difference between thinking something and doing it, Of isn't course, there? of course. And, but, and, and there's yeah. no doubt, it's not just a matter of the moral consequences, but the practical consequences, because people get hurt yeah. in an affair, if not either person in the affair, but or sometimes the partners, mm -hmm. uh, or the children, uh, and therefore it's actually dangerous territory. Well, but do you acknowledge that, difference. that it's hurtful and deceitful? No, because the key difference uh, with the internet dating sites is that, whereas in the past people would have affairs with someone in their neighborhood, in their social circle, someone at work, a colleague. The whole point of these internet dating sites get aimed at married people is that you meet complete strangers well outside your social circle so there isn't any gossip and the aim is complete confidentiality and discretion. But is it the secrecy that's, that's fundamental? Or, or the betrayal of trust? Well, you, 
the, the people, you can call it that, you can call it whatever you want. The point is, one of the reasons why people are using these websites is celibate marriages and sex-starved marriages. It's all very well to say that people should enjoy sex with the same partner for the whole of their life, which may be, you know, another 50, 60 years. But in practice, boredom sets in. In practice, one partner gets sick. In practice, one partner loses interest in sex. A third of marriages... Um, a quarter to a third of marriages are celibate, either celibate or sex-starved. A third of adults in Britain, the sex surveys show, are not having any sex at all. So Maybe I mean, there are an awful Maybe lot of people. Happy. There are a lot of happy relationships taking, that are celibate relationships. Who are not involved in but, sex. And also the answer the is then to try and but sort the that other, out. Exactly. And, but the and, other thing is that two other, thirds of people therapist. in Britain don't think that sexuality is the centre of marriage anyway. Well, it's so interesting if it you say that. It's not the centre of it, it's yeah. not okay. that important. Um, there's a measuring national well-being survey uh, which which came out this year anxiety from the office for national statistics anxiety is about paying bills and tensions over long working hours outrank adultery on the list of possible threats to stable family life do we need to rethink the way we approach it well, you see uh, there's great scripture in the bible that says don't let the sun go down on your anger so, you know in in my marriage we have the hargreaves rule i said to my wife we can argue about anything but at the end of the day we've got to be lovers again and if you keep that rule which we try to, to keep then that's where sex really plays a great part and, and as rabbi has said earlier i think it's about you're, you're using the wrong solution to the problem you know adultery is not the solution to the problem of sex starved marriages it's, it's communication, as Milo said. Start to find out what you need and what the problem is. Rabbi Jonathan, earlier you talked about you talked about deceit. You talked about the difficulty with mm. with monogamy. Um, if you are not monogamous, do you think you should confess it in a marriage? Uh, no. Actually, no. <laughs> I'm, I'm against adultery, uh, but if the other person, your, your, your husband or wife, doesn't know about the affair and you have an affair and, and then it's over, the one thing you should not do is then tell your partner and confess it. Wow. Because that, that, that breaks the trust that they had in you, it wrecks their confidence in the marriage and it's very hard to get a second chance. Um, and it's one of those rare examples where ignorance is bliss and that if you've made a mistake or you've had a fling and you think, oh, actually, it wasn't worth it, yes, the sex was good or whatever, but what's really important is the companionship, is the relationship, is the future, then it's much better to, for the other person to get back on an even track and, and to sort of try and put it behind you. Because what does it do to somebody else's confidence when you say, oh, by the way, darling, I've, I've had an affair? It, it destroys them. Um, and so if they don't know, why hurt them? Ignorance if you've got a chance... Is Pardon? Ignorance is bliss. Ignorance is bliss in this okay. situation. <laughs> I'd like to know what your thoughts are on that, so do keep sending us your texts and tweets on this. Let's catch up with Samantha, who's got some of them already. What are people saying, Samantha? Well, trust is certainly an issue. Um, on Facebook, Lee says it is betraying the most sacred bond and vow of lifelong love and commitment, and so calls into question whether the person can be trusted in any other matters as well. Now, Helen says, quite angrily, if you don't love someone enough to be faithful, don't keep them trapped in your lies. Um, but, Catherine, you may have won over some people with your statistics because uh, Trigger on Twitter says, I wouldn't do it myself, but it works for the French. Um, however, Nick on Twitter raises an interesting point. He says, if you want to be with multiple partners, an open relationship can be agreed. So perhaps that would remove the trust issue. Interesting point, Samantha. Is, isn't that what it's about? When you say don't, don't say if you've done it to Rabbi Jonathan, isn't an open relationship rather better so everybody knows where they stand if you are going to do it in the first place? In theory, I don't think it actually works in, relationship, in reality because people have, have, have needs, have trusts, have jealousies, have respects, and however much they say they're going to go into an open relationship, I think someone is going to end up being hurt. Milo? I've just found it extraordinary when you said you shouldn't tell. I mean, quite often when, when these things do come out, what you hear is, you know, it's not so much the initial offence, it's the lies that hurt more. And it's the lies that break the trust, not the act in the first place. And it seems to me that by compounding the mistake with deception and mendacity after the fact, um, you're making the, the offence much worse and much graver. And people know they work it out, they suss yeah. it out. These things always come to light. Well, um, no, I, I would agree that it's much better that the person hears a religious you leader first to give to lie if to it's going partner. to come out. But if, um, you know, it was with some online or it was uh, anonymous or whatever um, and there's uh, there's a way of protecting the other part why does it make it, any difference if it's anonymous or if I'm, it's I'm somebody really talking, you know? I'm not talking about I'm talking about the the feelings of the the hurt uh, spouse but it's the lies that hurt it's not it's not it's it's very often not 
the mistake which people well, can understand, French, people can, can come... Can the French sort of... approach is that courtesy towards your partner dictates that you should always be discreet and never admit to an affair even if they have suspicions. But courtesy also dictates that even if you have suspicions, you ignore it. Uh, if you think your partner's having an affair, you just ignore it because after all, all affairs are ephemeral, they never last. Uh, the evidence that in my book is that they, uh, 12 months is an absolute maximum and three months is quite common. And therefore, if it's going to pass, you're wasting your time having a row about it. Much Let better it not to have an affair in the first place and not to have to either lie or deceive <laughs> or confess. One of the I don't think you're going to get agreement there, but yes, final in, point. Final point, they're going to get exposed by this, these hackers, apparently. So, hey guys, let's stop going on this website because, <laughs> you know, the time's up. Well, there are many more of those, though, many more websites after that one. Well, look, Tinder, for instance, have said about a third of their people are um, married people going on there. All right. Well, thank you very much for that, all of you.